that I want to throw back anytime I see the question, can you retire by 40? Can you retire by 50? Not the question when I see I'm 65, I have nothing saved for retirement. What do I do now? 48% of people between the age of 55 and 65 have nothing saved for retirement. That's not when to start thinking about it. If you're there and you haven't, of course you need to start. But I'm hoping that most people are thinking about it before then. So instead of thinking, can I retire by 40? Can I retire by 50? Can I retire at any age? Instead of thinking how old, I want people to start thinking how much. And there's two sides to this coin. First, what do you need to retire? I can always tell when somebody is just kind of waking up to the idea that there might be another way to money other than working more than 40 hours a week for more than 40 years to retire on less than 40% of what you make. The normal way we're told to go to school, get good grades, get a job, contribute to your retirement account, and hopefully retire when you're so old you can't enjoy it. That shouldn't be everybody's plan. So the first side of the coin on can you retire in 10 years, this is the reason I want to look at 10 years instead of by 30, by 40, by 50, is you can retire at any age if you have the right money coming in. So a lot of times when you ask somebody, how much do you need to retire? You can tell they're really new to thinking about retirement, which is not a bad thing. We all start somewhere when they give a number and they say, I need $250,000. I need $5 million. I need $10 million. Retirement isn't a number. It's a freedom number. Why do most people consider 65 to be the retirement age or 60 or whatever age in your mind, most people assume to be the age of retirement. You have access to retirement accounts without paying a penalty, and you have access to so-so security and maybe Medicare. So you have recurring money that would be coming in or an expense of Medicare being covered to help you not have to work for money. So instead of thinking how much money, like a number that says you can retire, Let's look at what we call the freedom number. This is how much money does it cost you to live the life you want to every month? So when we talk about fi financial freedom, it doesn't mean that you have enough money to live the rest of your life because that's an unknown. We don't know how long you're going to live. We don't know what your expenses are going to be in the, in the future. But we do have a pretty good idea of what it's cost you every month because you have this information now. You can look at the last six months with an easier ability to be more accurate than trying to project the next six months. Look at your bank statements, credit cards, receipts. What have you been spending to live the life that you want to? And then kind of understand that some things are going to adjust. You're not going to be commuting for work. You're going to be paying less in taxes because this is one of the reasons why working for money is the dumbest way to make it. Working for money is one of the highest taxed forms of income. You're also not going to be saving for retirement. So there's several things where the cost is going to go down. There's one where the cost is probably going to go up. This is going to be healthcare. Most people, not all, but the majority of people get some form of health care provided by their employer, at least in the United States, which means right now you're paying 100% of the premium for your health care. It's just instead of you getting the money from your employer, the employer is paying part of that premium. So when you retire, you're going to have the same cost for health care, but instead of you and your employer paying for it, you are going to have your assets pay for it. So again, some things will go down, some things will go up. That freedom number is the first side of the coin. Kind of easier to figure out because you know how much you've been spending. And then before retiring and quitting your job, I, I suggest padding that income, increasing the amount. What I did is I kind of came up with a, a math equation where the less money you need in financial freedom, the bigger the multiplier that you need. So if you only need $1,000 a month to retire, I would probably want five or more times that coming in every month because one or two large expenses can really impact you. But if you're like me and you need 
I need about 4,000 a month to, to do a comfortable life. I still have sex. So I'm not, I don't have a cost of living where I'm at uh, as far as housing goes. But 4,000 a month is, is more than I've been spending every month in the last four years before retiring. I took a four multiplier. So when my cash flow passed 16,000 a month, which it did in 2022, I retired. And it was a monthly amount of money coming in. What is your freedom number? That's the first thing we need to determine. The second thing is, how are you going to make that money? So some people will start and grow a business with the intent of growing it to the point where it's large enough for somebody else to run the day-to-day -day so that you're not there. Other people will invest in stocks and use the 4% rule, uh, which the Trinity study was used to study the 4% rule. Investing in stocks took so much so that you have your freedom number, and they went off an annual number here, not a monthly, of investing 25 times what your annual expenses are. Because once you invest 25 times, then going off an average uh, annual growth in the stock market of 10%, out of that 10%, you could take the 4% to live on, enough to cover the taxes on that income, and then enough to cover in normal years, normal inflation. Or you can invest in dividend stocks or crypto or some other asset class that might not even be in, developed yet. I chose buy and hold real estate. So can you invest, can you retire in 10 years or less on the, the idea of the asset class that you're choosing? Starting and growing a business, nine out of 10 fail within the first five years. So you're going to have to start enough businesses to where you have one that succeeds. That's um, one of the things that most people that run a business will point out is that's not their first venture or their only business that they've ever ran. If you're going to invest in stocks and you know your freedom number, you can literally take your monthly freedom number, times it by 12, times that by 25, and come up with, in my opinion, a very large number that you need to invest. So can you invest? Can you retire in 10 years or less off of stocks? Not on the money that I made. Almost every year I've ever worked um, a W-2 job, I never made six figures until the last couple of years. Most years I made less than $50,000. Uh, so stocks wasn't a good option for me. I didn't want to do a business because I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm an investor. There's a big difference. Entrepreneurs, people say, I want to be an entrepreneur because I don't want a boss. Well, if you're going to run a business, everybody with a Yelp account is your boss. And they'll say things like, well, I don't want a 40-hour work week. Well, if you become an entrepreneur, you have an 80-hour work week, at least if you're becoming an entrepreneur with the goal of retiring within 10 years. So entrepreneur was off the table for me. Stocks was off the table for me. Crypto, a little too volatile a little too new of a tech, a little too easy for somebody who doesn't dedicate the time to learning about crypto to be successful at it. So not that it's not possible. It's that instead of that, I put the time and energy and effort into learning real estate. So whichever asset class you pick, it's going to have a learning curve. And remember, learning a skill takes a lot more time than using a skill. So whichever asset class you choose, the initial few, first few years, the ramp up years are going to be a lot harder than, I'd say, the next five years. So for me, I chose buy and hold real estate. It was an asset class I kind of understood. I didn't take the time in the beginning to educate myself. So what I'm doing now is I'm sharing the information and knowledge that I've learned in the last decade of investing in real estate. Made a lot of mistakes in that first year. Um, once I'm hoping that people that watch my content won't make because I'm giving you examples as to why it didn't work out. But I'm going to go through what 10 years looks like to retire in 10 years or less. This can be done when you're 18. You could start when you're 40 like I did. I made it to 40 without pretty much ever having $1,000 in the bank. And if I ever did, it was gone fast. One of those uh, single parents raising three kids that usually waited for tax returns to come in to do things and even then, the tax return was spent before it came in. But at 40, I started. And hopefully, your position is a little better than mine. I started after the 2008 housing crash. I was laid off from a police department because whenever there's a recession like that, there's no more crime and we don't need cops anymore. So I lost my job. And it was my second attempt to acquire a pension. My goal was work somewhere 20 years or more, maybe Marine Corps, then law enforcement, and retire with two pensions. Well, after Desert Storm, the Marine Corps downsized. And after 2008, law enforcement agencies downsized. A lot of qualified agents were laid off, or officers were off, laid off at the same time. So my pensions were taken away. 
So I decided to look at real estate to create my own pension because I had a couple of examples in my life of people who did that. My brother, a friend, my brother had 10 paid off rentals at 50, closed down his business. All his rentals were in place and had tenants in place and all the rehabs were done. He's been retired now for over eight years. So I had these examples of people who did it. I think it's it's a lot easier to do in 10 years than the way that I had to. When I got laid out from the police department, I was a single parent with three kids. I started teaching people how to drive trucks at a truck driving school. I was making $17 an hour. So here's the barriers that I had. I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. So I started with bad debt. I was only making $17 an hour at the truck driving school. So I didn't have a really high income. So my debt to income ratio was bad. And while I had been a truck driver and I had been in the Marines and I'd worked in law enforcement, going to work at a truck driving school was a change in occupations, which didn't make me very bankable with lenders. Bad debt to income, recent change in work. Uh, it's not a work environment. It's the other thing they look at because uh, they want you to have two years employment in the same field. You can change companies, but they want you doing the same thing. And I went from law enforcement to teaching truck driving with a bad debt to income ratio. So buying a house right off the bat really wasn't an option. And while most people might look at their situation and go, well, I can't retire at any point in time because I can't start investing. Starting investing doesn't mean that you buy investments. It means that you pick an investment class. It means that you learn that investment and, and you start educating yourself. So when I went out to start talking to lenders to figure out what am I able to buy, the answer was <laughs> nothing. Go home. Whenever you get a no, ask, but why? And so my follow-up why was, okay, well, why can't I buy? Well, you don't make a lot of money, $17 an hour. Of course, I could go out and drive a truck and make more money. I went to Old Carver Freightlands just before the truck driving school after the law enforcement job. Started working there making about $115,000 a year. And they went on strike. So I could have left the truck driving school to go drive trucks to make more money. That could have solved one issue. Then the lender said, the other thing you have a problem with is even if you made a lot more money, you have all of this bad debt. And I say it's $89,000 in bad debt because that's what I ended up paying off. The $89,000 in bad debt was actually $313,000 in debt in my name I didn't know existed until that divorce. Uh, and here's the Cliff Notes version if you find out about debt like that, that you might be able to reduce the amount that you actually end up having to pay off. I was talking to one of the the, the, debt, the lenders. So I was, I was the debt they were the debt or... And they asked me if I was going to file bankruptcy like my ex did. If I planned on filing bankruptcy, then they would take, I think it was 20 or 30% of what was owed on that debt. And I said, wait, that's a thing? Because of course, I'm thinking about bankruptcy. I'm not going to do it. Because at that point in time, I wasn't sure if I was going to go back into law enforcement or not. And that's a career killer if you do that. But I considered it. So it was an honest statement. So I contacted every single one of those people that I magically owed money to now. And almost all of them, all but three, took less, took somewhere between 20 and 30% of what was actually owed. Uh, three, it was uh, an apartment that we rented that I didn't know we had, a dentist bill and the Discover card. Those were the three that wouldn't budge. All, pretty much everybody else took less. So that 313 became 89. But at the time I started, $313,000 in bad debt, that's not very bankable. So the lender explained to me what debt to income ratio was. Not making a lot of money, having a lot of bad debt. How do you get around that? In the conversation, they just kind of mentioned, well, if you had rental income, the reason your brother who shut down his business and can still buy properties if he wanted to and get a loan and take out a home and line of credit is because he has rental income on his tax returns for more than two years, which means most lenders will look at the rental income of the property that you're purchasing, 75% of that in your debt to income ratio, which pretty much in most cases where you're buying cash flowing deals will be more than the debt that it's creating. So your debt to income ratio is almost not impacted by buying real estate. So what I did, a lot of bad debt, not a lot of income, and I had three kids that I had to raise. So that was my starting position. So hopefully your position is better than that. I hope. Not everybody's is. And there's people that have it way worse. I understand. So you can do this from starting from not a great position. I moved from my house into an apartment and rented the house out for two years. 
This allowed me to get rental income on my tax returns for those two years, and it allowed me to get two years of consistent income at the CDL school teaching people how to drive trucks. That gave me the consistent income in that field to make me bankable. It gave me the rental income being factored into my debt to income ratio to solve that problem too. Another caveat that some of the lenders had, because you, you want a lender shop to get the best rates and terms, is they said, we want the majority of your leases to have at least three months remaining. So month to month leases don't do you so good. Short term uh, leases didn't do very good back then. Now they might be factored by some lenders. They only use an area average on that. But having a tenant on a long lease in the house, having two years of work at the truck driving school, having two years to get all of the debt to income from 313 down to 89,000 and start paying off what I called the worst debt at the two year point after saving for those two years. So here's the start if you have an okay starting position. The first few years suck and it's slow and it feels like nothing's going to happen. But how long would it take you to save? Now, this is working overtime, learning a skill, becoming more attractive to your employer and trying to increase your income. Or like I did, developing a side hustle as well as overtime, playing games like World of Warcraft and selling things online. Maybe you have a side hustle of mowing lawns on the weekend or some way of making money in addition to the effort that you're putting in to increase your income at your job. Could be changing jobs too to increase that income. How long will it take you to save the down payment on a primary house? Because when you do primary house occupation, you get better lending options. You get a better interest rate. You get a lower down payment. You can use things like your VA loan and FHA loan, first time owner uh, loan pro uh, programs out there, like the one that I used to get my first house before I was an investor, which was zero down, no mortgage insurance. I walked away from the closing table with $1,200. Like there are first time home buyer pro programs where it's a lot easier to get on the property ladder. For those two years, I saved up the down payment to do a 5% down payment conventional loan on a duplex. So after two years, I've now got the house rented out. I buy the duplex. That gives me, I lowered my housing costs. This is called house hacking. So my expenses for renting my, my house, my when I moved into the apartment, was $1,500 a month. When I moved into the duplex, it was about $300 a month. So I added $1,200 a month to my saving rate. After those two years, it was another two years before I bought the next duplex. Now, this is working my well. I want to say up, but I was demoted uh, from instructor to lead instructor to operations manager to company president for the truck driving school. So I've been slowly demoted through my job, climbing that corporate ladder, still working my side hustle, still working overtime, renting out the house, learning things from bigger pockets, one rental at a time on how to rent my property. I learned the binder strategy, which is how I get my tenants to ask me to raise the rent. And I started making more money from the rentals. So once you have a couple of rentals in place, now this is four years in. I've done two things, right? Two actual investments, a lot of things, saving, increasing income, learning how this works, learning what DTI is, trying to tackle this worst debt, not just the bad debt, but the worst debt, learning what good debt is and trying to get into as much of it as possible. Now this thing started, the income snowball starts to kick in because I've got a couple of rentals. So at four years, if you can buy two duplexes, it was a year and a half for me to buy the next one. And then it took a year to pay off one of the mortgages, which was a mistake I shouldn't have done. And then I bought a fourplex and a triplex. But if you're looking at a 10-year span of can you retire, what is your freedom number? What would that take? If you can reduce the cost of your housing by house hacking, or if you can move to another country to reduce your, your health care expenses, which are cheaper outside of the U.S., whatever you can do to lower those expenses that it takes to retire, and then add cash-flowing assets. Most of us overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in five. Those first five years are going to be slow and they're going to feel like they take forever. But after those five of making purposeful decisions of increasing income, decreasing expenses, working on your credit score, finding out from a lender what your options are, picking a market, picking a strategy, and adding cash flowing assets and letting that income snowball kicks in, the next five years will go faster. So, if you add a rental every two years, and then every year and a half, and then every year, by the time you get to 10 years, you're going to have somewhere between one, two, three, four, five, or six properties. And if you're doing small multifamily, that's somewhere between 10 and 15 rental units. 
If you're in a low cost of living area and you're investing in someplace like Gary, Indiana, you're probably going to have a lot more rentals than that. If you're in a high cost of living area where I'm at, I'm in between Tacoma and Olympia and Washington, where instead of paying $64,000 for a triplex like Millennial Mike did, I'm paying in the beginning, 300,000 for uh, duplexes. The last couple I got for 400,000. So prices have gone up. Takes longer to save the down payment. But when you average somewhere between 500 and and $1,000 a unit, it doesn't take as many to reach financial freedom. So I believe that even if you're starting from a bad position, you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less. It doesn't come down to how much money you have or how much you have invested. Often it comes down to what are you willing to do? How many times are, are you going to tell people, there's no way I could house hack? Did you know that there are versions of house hacking that don't involve shared living spaces or even have tenants live on the same property as you? You can use an owner-occupied loan to purchase a house, live in it for at least a year, and then move out and rent it out. Having it be an owner-occupied purchase means you had that low down payment. Easier to save it up, easier to get in there, easier to qualify for. More lending options because it's owner-occupied. A better interest rate because it's owner-occupied. And when you move out, so people who say, I can't house hack, you're literally saying financial freedom is not worth me moving. If you think you're willing to work hard to get the money that it takes to invest, I hope you would add to your skill set, the willingness to even move to reach financial freedom, because it doesn't have to be forever. It can just be for now, move for a year or two. You can move back to your dream house if that's where you were living. I've house hacked to reach financial freedom and retire. I house hacked twice. I recently closed on a new duplex and I'm in my third house hack. So it's not something that once you learn how to do it, you might want to stop. I will admit on this last purchase, I wasn't as concerned with yield as I was with where I wanted to live and what I wanted the elements of that place to be. It's still going to get the yield that I want. But are you willing to do a form of house hacking in those first few years, even if it's one that doesn't involve having tenants on the same property? I had young kids. So I wanted our own area. I picked a duplex that was side by side, so not over under. Each unit had its own fenced yard. And between the, the, the living areas, there were two garages. It was no different than having a neighbor, except I got to screen and vet the neighbor and had control of evicting them if I needed to. How many millions of families with kids live in apartments, live in condos, live in townhouses, have neighbors close to them that don't have that control? Are you willing to change companies if that's the biggest increase you could do to your income? Are you willing to take a promotion if it's something that adds responsibilities you might not want but gets you the income that it takes to reach financial freedom? Because the alternative is working until you're so old you can't enjoy retirement. I'm going to go through the questions and hopefully there's some questions that come in today. This is a random midday live stream on a Saturday. One of the reasons why I'm doing this is uh, there will be no live stream this Tuesday. There will be a video that comes out at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, but I will either be on an airplane about that time or landing in, I think, Turkey or somewhere to go on a Mediterranean cruise. I'll be gone for two weeks. I'll be doing some short live streams from places that have a good Wi-Fi connection. I'll be uploading videos, but I won't be here Tuesday for the live this coming week or probably the following week. Wi-Fi service on ships is not good. It's like being on a plane. You, 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 you spot a service and when it does, it updates um, not consistently. Um, so I wanted to do this live stream, talk about a couple of things. First, um, my course for the entire month of September, I'm taking $100 off the price of the course. Throughout the entire month of October, every Saturday, we are going to do a course members live Zoom call. Uh, I have to check and make sure that that's up to date and that that's the actual price that you're getting. Uh, today at four o'clock, so in about a half an hour, so I have a half an hour to answer questions. I'm going to do a members only live where we look at deals. So I see Frank is in the uh, comments. If you're hanging around here at four, it's going to be a members only where we jump on Zoom. We look at deals in my market or your market. 
and we dig deep into see like a stream of consciousness look at what would it be like to look at that deal what would be the pros what would be the cons would we dig deeper would we dismiss it so howdy to everybody who's hanging out here on a saturday in current world hello future land if it's not saturday howdy 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 Valentino, howdy. I'm starting at 40 also. Luckily, I have a decent credit score and zero debt. Looking forward to 50s and 60s more, God willing. Yeah, uh, it would have been a lot easier to start without the debt. Uh, but if you start at 40, um, I could have retired at 48. And I don't know that I'll ever regret working more. I, I love my job. I worked four more years and retired last year at 52. Uh, so I'm, I'm in my 50s. <laughs> and I, I can't put into words what being retired at this age is like compared to the people I know who are retiring in their late 60s when Social Security and Medicare kicks in and they're not even really ambulatory and where a cruise is you're on the ship and maybe you go to the, the port versus I'm looking at every single excursion um, and not having to pick and choose which ones I feel like I can still do. Um, again, like I said, can't put it into words. Because, and here's here's a thing I, I want to do a video on this too. I'm not sure yet. I want to kind of come up with some educational points to make sure I put in there. Is uh, I was <laughs> I like to fight on Facebook. I don't know. My, my inner child comes out when people say stupid things. Kind of like today, I saw. Uh, YouTube channel redacted, uh, which is Clayton Morris, who used to own Morris Invest. Some great background information you should Google there. Uh, took a poll on, do you think there's a housing crash? And it said a major housing crash within the 12 months, the next 12 months. Now, his channel is not mostly about real estate anymore. And mostly it's um, the, the end of the world. The United States sucks. And uh, cons- what do they call it? Theory. Uh, conspiracy theory stuff. And entertainment, right? I like it. I watch. I watch his stuff. But so not everybody watching his channel is into real estate. If you ask most people in real estate, do you think there's a crash coming or not? It depends on if they watch crash bro channels or uh, stuff like Hartman, Zuber, Money Mike, Lumberjack, or me. People who are investing and saying, look, even if there's a crash coming, you still do the same thing: hunt for great deals and buy them. Right? You might buy more if things go on sale because everyone else is going to back off when prices start to come down because there will be a reason prices came down, which means less buyers. But the average person watching Redacted, it's like 84% voted that they see a crash coming. I want to make a video on that. <laughs> so, Alentino, you're starting at 40. I look forward to hearing how it goes for you. Update me as we go. Anna Kay, howdy. See you here on a live. Uh, if you're available at four, we're doing a members only on Zoom. Adam, how much money did you spend on the new house and rehab? And how much money do you have left over? So where am I at currently? Uh, $400,000 purchase price with an ARV. I, I say about seven fifty, dollars but all of the investors that I've had look at it and do a comparison around in the same area. It's much higher than that. They're, they're saying six, you know, seven figures. What is, what is it mean? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, so eight or 900,000. My ARV I'm estimating is seven fifty. dollars So 400, I purchased it. Uh, walked through with a contractor, said we'd spend about 30 on the rehab. Um, I budgeted 50, but have set aside 80. Right. I had an 80 sitting there going, okay, this is what I probably am going to spend. It's looking like I'm going to be right around 50 when I'm done, I think, because there was a couple of things we weren't expecting, a little bit of rot in a couple of places. Um, so what have I spent so far? So 400 days, so it was like 400 and a couple thousand dollars because of title insurance and inspection. And I did not do an appraisal because it was self-funded. Um, if this is a modified bird, I might refinance at the end and pull money out. I don't think I'm going to. Honestly, I, even if rates drop to a really low number, I'm, I'm don't compare someone's year 12 to year one, two, three, or four. In growth mode, I would definitely do a full burr, pull the money out and re, redeploy and um, do that. I, I didn't do any burrs in my first decade of investing. This is my first one and my last one. 
um, I've spent just rough numbers. $28,000, I want to say, about, probably. And there's one more thing that's going to clear. So it's probably going to pass 30000 by the time I'm back from the cruise. And there is still countertops, paint, rough outs done on electric past inspection. That's great. Yay for the government letting me beg for permission to have a house here. Not bitter. I just hate permits. <laughs> um, yeah, so still have 50-ish thousand sitting there for the rest of this place. Going to spend probably at least, I know of at least 10. I'm saying I'm going to spend 20 fi finishing touches because I've already purchased the appliances and all that stuff's done. They get delivered soon. Actually, I have somebody coming to hang out at the house the whole day that I'm gone because it's going to be delivered while I'm gone. So that's the rough, rough numbers, Adam. Uh, and I might just leave all of the money in the property. I didn't spend money to buy this property. I moved it. There's a video on my channel called The Lost Decade. And it, my brother said a sentence, this one sentence, and it stopped me from investing for 10 years, right? From 30 to 40, when I started thinking, maybe I should buy some real estate. But I still thought my brother was crazy because he was running a business. He had his own tree service. And he was buying and rehabbing his rentals on his own. So he'd work 10 to 14 hours on trees and five to eight hours on his rentals. Like that was nuts until he turned 50 and he flipped a switch and shut down the tree service and all 10 rentals were paid off and in place. And I was like, oh, there was an end game. They had a goal. So I started looking at, maybe I should do this, but this sentence, this is the sentence that stopped me. He said, every time I buy a rental in 11 years, I get my money back. I thought that was stupid. Like, you have your money. It's it's right there. You're going to spend it on a property so that in 11 years you can get it back? That doesn't seem real smart. And then I had the epiphany moment where he wasn't getting his money back. That's when he calculated that he had doubled it. When you purchase a rental property, you are not spending money. You pay for things like an appraisal, an inspection, title insurance, um, those kind of things. Like you, you might be spending two or three, maybe $5,000, but you're not spending your down payment. You're not, and, and when you purchase a place cash like the one I just did, I didn't spend it. I took $400,000 from the bank and put it into the property. It's still there. It's mine. Once this is done, I can, I can live here for two years, sell this place, for what I estimate the low end of 750 versus my investor friends that have said much more than that. So 750, make up to $250,000 in capital gains without paying any taxes on it. So I'll have a tax liability for the bit that's above my basis of 400,000 that I purchased and the receipts that I have for the repairs that I put into it. The gains above that, anything above 250, I want to pay taxes on because I'm not married. If you're married, it's up to 500,000. Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets uses a version of this that they call the live and flip. They move into a place, they rehab it while they're living there, live there for at least two years, and then sell it and get up to at least five hundred thousand dollars in gains without paying taxes on it. Rinse and repeat, and then she invests in mostly stocks. But uh, she actually just did a, an episode with uh, "I will teach you to be rich." I forget his name, but. Uh, she said her struggle is they're, they're still living a frugal life because mentally they're still frugal. And I actually kind of struggle with that too. That, the video that I have that's coming out, I think it was today, this morning. No. It's either today or Tuesday is I'm frugal. Uh, I don't want to be frugal in retirement. So I'm like learning how to have a reverse budget. So Adam, I hope that helps to know how much it costs, where I'm at. And I understand not everybody has literally basically like a half a million dollars sitting around. The only reason I purchase this is because once you reach financial freedom and you use a multipliers, right? So I need about 4,000 a month to live. I didn't retire when I hit 4,000. I retired when I hit over 16. Um, and now that I've rented out the unit, the room, not the unit, the room that I moved out of before I even have this place done and anybody living here, the cash flow went up $1,000, but I have about a $400 expense here in this place if I'm calculating insurance and property taxes. Uh, that will be offset by the other unit being rented out here and increase my cash flow even more than that. If you're using a multiplier of what it actually takes you to retire, the money kind of builds up. 
And yeah, you can do things like I'm I'm buy a boat, buy an RV. I'm I'm taking a couple of cruises every now and then. I'm going to Thailand for three months. Probably and actually make more, save more money in Thailand than I will buy if I stayed here in the U.S. Um, if you if you're really stupid with money, you can go on a date. But I'm not that stupid. Uh, so as the money built up, I started looking at well, I could I could buy a bigger fourplex with you know a larger down payment. Um, or I can add a Burr. I had a Burr search going for a while. And then I looked at the Burr search and I found a Burr house hack, but I don't need to pull the money out because my goal isn't a bigger portfolio. This, this confuses a lot of people. I was actually watching a video that uh, Lumberjack Landlord or Millennial Mike, one of them sent this morning, Ryan Pineda and Pace Morby, really good, like hour and a half. I'm just like everybody here. I still take in content on YouTube to make myself, uh, better at what I'm doing to stay motivated because reaching financial freedom those first few years, not that easy. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm sharing the information, I kind of want to see, you know, what are other people doing? And Ryan Pineda and um, Pace Morby spent, first of all, they spent a pretty good uh, portion of the video talking about what happens to your anatomy when you take something like steroids. <laughs> but part of the video was they are very different than some of the investors that they meet and know. Because some investors have a freedom number and they invest for that number and then they stop. Where Pace and Ryan are, they're not doing it for the money. Doesn't sound real when somebody says that, but they are doing it for the next deal, for the experience, for the fun, the network, the lifestyle of growing a portfolio. And I agree, I am very different. The last thing I want is a bigger portfolio. The bigger and more of a machine you make your investing, the less time freedom I think you're going to have. This is the video that I want to make. I was arguing on Facebook. I hate when my memory kicks in, but I was arguing on Facebook because somebody said something about stocks. And if you're in one of the Choose FI groups, they are 100% about stocks and real estate is stupid, right? They, they asked some question about retirement. And I pointed out, I have invested, you know, up till last year. So this new investment wasn't in this conversation. $320,000. That's what I have invested in down payments and closing costs before this recent purchase over the period of 10 years. And last year had a cash flow of $203,000 in profit, right? So I was able to retire with that much. It's kind of why I chose real estate. And they said, well, you can't be retired if you own real estate. That was the, that's the attack when you talk to somebody who does stocks. Well, you're not retired if you have to manage tenants or get a, it's always 11 o'clock at night, plumber call, which doesn't happen. You, you They have, call you, and if they do, you're calling a plumber or a handyman to go handle that. You're not going out there with a plunger. And this will be the video I want to make. Can you be retired if you own rentals? Let me know in the comments what you think. I was working 50 to 60 hours a week running a business or as an instructor there, I was working overtime, running side, you know, side hustles to make money versus the whole time in the last, I don't know, three, four years, I had 16 rental units and I averaged less than two hours a month to manage that portfolio. Most months were less than an hour, but some months would go a little more. So the average is two month, two hours a month. Is that retired? Is it retired when I can take a cruise, come back and plan a three-month trip to Thailand and know that any issue that pops up here, up to and including a death on the premises, a complete burden down of a rental, I can handle it through texts or emails. I don't even have to be there. Can you be retired with rentals? Sean. Howdy. I have a wheelchair ramp that is attached to one of my units. Me too. Would you leave it or does it not provide any value to the property? Someone is willing to take it away. Uh, I have a tenant that's in place that has a family friend that visits. And that's what the ramp is there for. So while the tenant's in place, the ramp is staying. As soon as that tenant's gone, the ramp is is out of there. Unless uh, an applicant would ask for it, I would would build a ramp. They're not actually not that much to build. It's, It's much cheaper to build a ramp than to build stairs. Um, so I would remove it depending, I guess, on the aesthetics, it's possible to leave it. If it doesn't look the the one that's at my property looks kind of weird. Um, 
So I'm removing it because of that. If they're willing to take it away and you don't think the next tenant's going to need or want it, I'd probably get rid of it. Wombat Striker, my personal opinion, which was influenced by Dion in this case, is think about what type of tenant do you want? Does being wheelchair accessible support the type of tenant that you would prefer? That's actually a really good point and a good way to look at it. Uh, I think you're referring to, I would never discriminate. I have tenants who have kids. And if the applicant has kids, I don't use that as a, you can you know get approved or not, right? So don't discriminate. But you can make your property attractive to the type of tenant that you want. And I would prefer, I've said this before, I would prefer somebody, prefer somebody moves in with nine Rottweilers than with a kid. Kids have done all of the damage to my properties. It's never been pet damage. Even, even pet urine problems are easier to take care of than the damage kids do. Because they don't just break doors. They break the jam that goes to the door. Like it's that. What, what are kids doing? Nowadays? Anyway, get off my lawn. Um, with this, would you want to attract the tenant that needs the wheelchair access or not? I don't know. Never thought about it. I think I kind of would. I think people like that are less likely to move once they get settled in, you know their area. So it's kind of the, one of those things that could be a factor of, I want the property to have physical aspects that helps limit tenant turnover because that's one of the more expensive things for an owner. Um, so that is something to think about too. Wisconsin, howdy. You had 10,000 in reserves for seven units. How much reserves would you have for one unit? So a good, good question, Buzz Town, to be really specific. Anytime I talk about reserves, I say, when I had seven or less units, right, or less, I had $10,000 in reserves. This covers a couple of months without a payment, a water heater uh, that needs replaced, a garage door that fails, a roof that needs replaced, um, all of those things, an eviction if you have to go through it. So 10000 to me was the minimum. And I want to see if I can explain this clearly enough to where you can separate year one to year eight. So in year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it was always 10000 for seven units or less. When I started going above seven units, I raised that to 30000 because more things can go wrong than one or two at a time, right? So Buzz, to, to add Buzz to, to answer your question, even with one, I would do 10,000. The lender's going to want you to have at least three months of your mortgages, which are however many, it's one or two or at that point um, in reserves. And they will count 50% of your retirement accounts, right? So as I was growing the portfolio, it was 10,000, went to 30. And then I found a deal on a fourplex that should have been, my estimate, $900,000. It should have been $900,000 for 590. Right? This was just horribly advertised. It was side-by-side -side townhomes, uh, 1,200 square foot units with garages, each one with their own garage, but it's a fourplex. And they had one bad uh, angled picture that showed stuff that needed fixed, didn't show the garages, didn't show that it was side-by-side -side because most fourplexes in Washington are those ugly cubes. And it was just extremely underpriced. And I thought, well, I need to, this is a house hack I'm going to pursue. Uh, now it's like 1.5, 1.6, right? That's an actual current value. Um, so I want to think it's probably my best or second best purchase just because of ridiculous, stupid in, in appreciation over the last couple of years. But to go and to purchase this, to have the money for the down payment, I went down to $200 in my all of my savings and checking accounts. I had actual $200 in cash. The reason I would say never do this in the beginning is because you don't have your legs under you to know what return you're expecting. You don't know what rents should be. You don't know how to find, screen, place, maintain, and keep tenants. Like all of those skills you need to learn. I would keep a good reserve for the mistakes you're going to make. Right? I did. I had a whole year where the rent wasn't being paid. The person had moved out, rented the house to someone else and was collecting the rent. Like all those mistakes can happen in the beginning. When I went down to $200 in my account to acquire this, they used my retirement account as a reserve. And so it satisfied the lender's needs. So I had the money I could pull out, which I ended up pulling out a couple of years later anyway, not a couple of years later, not, not too much long after that. When um, COVID hit, I was able to pull it out without the penalty. So I yanked it on pot of triplex, which might be my best deal so far. Even better than a $590,000 fourplex that has about tripled in value. It's like owning real estate over a period of time is good. Uh, I had $17,000 in credit cards that weren't used. 
I had a paid off. Did I have? Yeah, I had a paid off house at that time, so I probably could have line it, got a line of credit. Like I had a lot of options if things went sideways, but I also had a good job still, and I had cash flow from my rentals, and I was purchasing a fourplex that had tenants in place. It was a house hack, so I did cash for keys to get one out. Um, but the other three, and the one that was cash for keys to get out. So this was like January sixth, we closed. I got the rents for January from title, right? So no worrying about getting tenants and if they're still paying. So the four units rent came in from the 6th to the 31st of January. And then I got the other three units for February and my mortgage wasn't due until March. So I had two months without a mortgage of rents coming in all but except for the first five days of January. And I pretty much by the end of February had $10,000 back in my savings account because I knew my market I knew the rents. I knew how the rent was going to work from title for that first month. The $200 I had left was quickly going to go back up. And that was right about the time I increased it to 30,000 and stayed there. Don't compare ye later years to earlier years. In the beginning, I would keep good reserves. Uh, later, you can be as creative as you want. Marav Nakir, Nakar, howdy. Welcome to being a member. I appreciate it. So, if you joined the membership thing, how it works is there is a members only, it'll show up for you now, I think a members only live available today at four, which is in 14 minutes. So I'll be ending this here pretty soon. Um, it's YouTube, just like this. So you can just hang back in YouTube and watch if you're not comfortable with more. But in the first comment that I'll do on that will be, I will post the Zoom link. So you can jump on Zoom. However many members show up, we hang out, we talk, we look at, um, I open up emails from my realtors on the searches that I have going on, and I'm hoping not to find one because I don't want to buy another one right now. And if a great deal popped up, I'd probably bounce on it because I'm not stupid, but I don't want to. So we look at deals that other people have too, and we will compare and look at what would we look at in the market and what would we consider about the property. Then we run through the numbers. Um, so if you can make it, look forward to seeing you there at four. We do two of those a month um, is the plan. And then we get some questions here really quick. Uh, wealth Building Journey. Howdy. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, remember Wealth Building Journey, even though you've already purchased the course, the deal is going on for this course for this month. Um, all of October, there will be course Zoom calls on Saturday. Uh, Josh, I just had an electrician inspection and my electrician did it virtual. Nice. It could have been virtual. This guy came in. I mean, I have a good, I want to I'm gonna get the name right. I'm going to do a video about him. There's a, if somebody's here locally, there is a really good, uh, what is it, putting ads? Yeah, skip over. Why did it do that? Um, the inspection probably took 15 minutes. I think when he walked in and he saw the quality of work, I really think the inspection is just to make sure a professional is actually doing it. Uh, checked a couple of things and it was less than 15 minutes and he was gone. Could have been done virtually. Um, but, uh, uh, have you done a midterm rental duplexes for house hacking? Aren't making sense as long-term rentals? So I am considering doing midterm rentals. I've considered it. I haven't done it. So here's what I did though, because in my market, they weren't making sense either, right? Prices and rates have gone up and rents are going up, but not enough to, to give you a lot of good deals. I watched days on market. So the Current property that I closed on and another one that I had an offer accepted on uh, had been on the market over 100 days and I made ridiculously low offers. This one was listed originally at 500,000. I offered four. And while they countered at 77, 44, 22, we settled at four because I wasn't going above that for this with the amount of work that it needed. Even that I'm weirdly going to create a couple hundred thousand dollars when this is done, uh, I still wouldn't do it because it's the other one I had the offer accepted on. I self-manage, it would have the return I wanted. It had tenants in place um, and I was going below. It wasn't as big a drop. They were at the last listing, it had dropped a little, it was like 414 and I would offer accepted at 390. It made sense as a self-managing uh, rental that I have had a friend who's here today, reach out and ask about that rental and look at it. But with property management, I don't think it makes sense. All right. Josh, 
I'm planning on starting my real estate investment journey next year. I own a three, two single family house now and think I could cash flow 500 a month if I were to move out and move into another future rental. Your thoughts on moving every one to two years to expedite gaining rentals. This way I can move each primary residence and only have to put down 5% instead of 20%. It seems most mortgage lenders will allow me to make the property a rental if I stay in it primary for at least a year, but not sure if that's typical with every lender. Uh, so this will be the last question that I wrap up with before I head over to the members only live stream. I think it's a brilliant strategy, Josh. It's exactly kind of what my plan was. I would stay away from FHA loan. So you may know this, so please don't let it seem like a lecture. I'm going to say that just in case there's somebody who loved your question who didn't think this through. Because this was a comment on, uh, on a, in a real estate mastermind group where, where realtors just don't know what the hell they're talking about. FHA is not designed for first-time home buyers. People think it is because it has an F and an H in it. FHA was designed to put construction workers back to work by allowing people with terrible credit and terrible debt-to-income ratios purchase a property that is government-backed, at least for the mortgage insurance, right? Like the, the FHA back. It has a lot of restrictions that I don't like. You want to buy one and then every two or three years move to another? Well, you can only have one FHA at a time. So you'd have to refinance out, hoping that there's enough equity to refinance out of FHA. Mortgage insurance lasts the term of the loan. So if you put down less in, with FHA, it could be 10%. Some lenders, most lenders, it's less than 20%. But you have mortgage insurance that lasts until you either sell the property, pay off the mortgage, or uh, refinance. Instead of FHA, if you're going to use that strategy, my first duplex I purchased, and so did Millennial Mike, with a 5% down conventional loan. So find a lender that will do 5% down conventional on a duplex. If you're buying a house or a house with an ADU, you can find lenders that will do 3% down on the first one. So that's better than FHA. And your mortgage insurance goes away automatically when you hit 22% equity without having to refinance, pay off the property, or sell. And FHA gets lenders all up in your business. If you live in a house and you want to move to another one with an FHA loan, they're going to ask you why. Because it's not meant to make investors. It was meant, it was created in 1934 because of the Great Depression. We had over 2 million construction workers that were laid off. FHA loans were created. The whole Federal Housing Authority was created to get construction workers back to work. It's not meant to create investors. So if you go, I want to buy a place so I can rent my house out, the FHA lender will say, no. So I wouldn't want to involve FHA in my business. If you have a conventional loan, I went from a single family to a duplex, duplex to a fourplex, fourplex to a duplex on my three different house hacks. So yeah, I could have done more, but I think what you'll find, Josh, is you move into that first one, you reduce your housing expense. Maybe you house hack a second time. And then you're going to realize you have rental income from two or three units coming in. Your job is probably paying more. You've developed a kind of frugal mindset just for the period of investing, not for the rest of your life. And the money's piling up and you'll start to, like I did, wasn't expecting to, but my single family, the duplex, the next duplex was a 20% down investment purchase. I wanted the bigger down payment, better cash flow, better equity position. Um, wasn't trying to add units as fast, but my, my properties have always been at least a 20% down payment since the first 5% down uh, duplex. So yes, I think it's a great strategy. But you might find that instead of house hacking every one to two, one to three years, you might house hack two or three times total in those 10 years. And by that second, that second group of group of five years, you're going to be adding properties with bigger down payments. Just a thought. Okay. Um, I don't have time to answer your question, JR. Let me take a screenshot of it and I will address that in a short live stream another time. But thank you all for hanging out on a Saturday. And if you are in the members uh, group, I will see you in a few minutes and let's look at some deals. Again, no live stream Tuesday and probably not the following Tuesday because I will be suffering through not being retired because of rentals on a Mediterranean cruise. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.